Thank you, Veronica and Anurag, for the invitation. Um, yes, today I will tell you a bit about ESS. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. I will give first a brief introduction to the neutron landscape as it is today in Europe to give you a bit of context. Uh, I will explain a bit about the very basics about reactor versus spallation sources. And then I will go to a few slides on an ESS uh, update. I will tell you a bit about how the ESS will work, what kind of instruments uh, we'll offer and what scientific communities we aim uh, to serve with these instruments. Then Anurag asked that I spend a bit of time to, to explain uh, to you guys how to actually get access to large facilities, in this case, neutron facilities. And I will cover a bit about proposals, peer review, how access works, and the kinds of things you should think about when preparing a beam time uh, proposal. Then I will move to the life sciences or biological materials. And I will tell you a little bit about the importance of isotope labeling of your organic or biological samples. And then finally, I will show you a kind of specific research example from my own work and how I got into neutrons uh, in the search for cancer treatments uh, against a metastatic uh, cancer marker. So this is a map of Europe showing you all the different neutron scattering centers uh, that are uh, existing. And you can see the list here uh, on the left. Uh, the list is, I would say, from 2017 from an ENSA report that was uh, prepared to give an overview uh, of all the facilities. And it looks like quite a lot, but I will point out that um, LLB down here in, in German, um, France, sorry, HZB in Germany and IFA in Norway are three examples of um, reactor based uh, neutron scattering facilities that have been closed in recent years. So we've lost actually quite a number of instruments and beam lines. Um, at the moment, the only new one that is being constructed in all of Europe is in fact uh, the ESS, as you can see here in the bottom tip of Sweden. Uh, almost all of these facilities shown here are in fact reactor-based neutron sources. And today there is only one operating spallation neutron source and that's ISIS uh, in the UK. And ESS under construction will be the second uh, spallation source uh, in Europe. And of course, this has a lot to do with the politics uh, of reactors. They're not popular things to build new at the moment. And in fact, much of Europe is trying to phase out and get rid of uh, not only power nuclear reactors, but also research uh, nuclear reactors. And this is a trend uh, we could probably reasonably expect to continue. This is a timeline of neutron uh, sources or facilities, and it shows the effective uh, thermal neutron flux uh, and then the year uh, along the bottom. And what you can see here is, of course, that neutrons have been around for a long time, but the early days really were dominated, and to today actually, by reactor-driven uh, sources of neutrons in orange. And, and But what you can see is like since the 60s or so, the, the maximum flux that we are able to extract from these facilities has really plateaued, and there have not been any major advances in squeezing more neutrons out of a reactor for 50, 60 years now. Um, in blue towards the, the right of the curve or the, the graph, you can see the advent of spallation sources and the kinds of improvements uh, in flux that we can get out of these facilities. Uh, there are quite some modern sources available to researchers today, the SNS uh, in the US, JPARC in Japan. The Chinese are constructing a spallation source that will soon be commissioned any day now. And of course the ESS in a couple of years. And you can see that the ESS at the far end here is expected and built to be the brightest uh, neutron source in the world. As I said in the slide before, many of the reactors shown here in orange have been shut down or will not be renewed uh, at the end of their lifespan. So we can really expect this uh, domination of spallation sources uh, to continue. However, places like the SNS, JPARC and ESS are really large and cost a lot of money to build and operate. And there is a bit of talk in the physics community about finding alternative options to maybe not be, build only these huge uh, spallation sources, but maybe building fewer 
more compact, <laughs> less politically dividing <laughs> uh, reactor type sources to have more opportunities for users in different parts of the world uh, to do research. Um, that, of course, is just a discussion at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure what will happen in the future. For the moment, Europe is putting its eggs in the ESS basket, you could say. Uh, the, this slide and the next is like a really, really basic explanation of the differences between research reactors and spallation sources. Um, and at the heart of a reactor, as shown here in this diagram, is a core of enriched uh, uranium-235, typically 8 to 10 kilos of fissionable material kept in ponds uh, filled with light or heavy water uh, to keep them cool. Of course, naturally, uranium-235 undergoes fission, uh, where it decomposes to smaller, lighter atoms. And with each fission event, there is a release of neutrons. These neutrons come out at a fairly high energy, and they have to be slowed down um, or moderated. And in fact, we use moderators uh, to, to cool or slow them down so we can actually uh, use them in neutron scattering experiments. So besides sewing them down, uh, we also uh, introduce monochromators and they essentially chop up the beam in some way so that we only extract the relevant wavelength or energy for the particular material we would like to study. So beam lens are often equipped with uh, moderators and monochromators. Around this core, um, then there are beam guides that then transport the, the neutrons to the relevant instruments shown here at these end stations. The situation at spallation sources looks uh, very different. We don't have fissionable uranium material on site. Uh, instead, we produce uh, neutrons in a pulsed on-demand uh, way. Uh, this cartoon at the top shows the components uh, that the ESS has, all the way from the source to the target where the neutrons are produced. At the front end, we have an ion source where we um, boil the electrons of hydrogen plasma to produce protons. This proton beam is then injected into the accelerator that is composed of many, many very technical components that ultimately all together serve to accelerate the uh, proton beam to roughly 96% the speed of light when it reaches the end here. At this stage, they are directed into a tungsten target that is helium cooled. And it is this interaction between the incoming proton beam and the tungsten target that actually produces uh, the neutrons. This uh, is shown in the bottom right here where you have a primary incoming proton and you knock out a secondary a neutron in very basic terms. This is this process is called spalling, hence uh, spallation neutrons. These are produced in this interaction at roughly 10% the speed of light. So they have been massively slowed down, but they're still extremely fast and high energy for what we would like to use them for. So the same situation that we have at reactors, we also build moderators uh, to slow them down. Beyond moderators, we then direct them into beam ports. Uh, you can see in the bottom, kind of here. Uh, and then often at most beam lines at spallation sources, we introduce a series of chopping disks or choppers that spin and chop up the neutron beam into the appropriate wavelengths. So you can literally slice and dice quite a range of neutron energies into the appropriate ones that your instrument is optimized for. And then finally, the same as at reactors, at the very end of beam lines, of course, you have all your various sophisticated instrumentation where you will put your sample and measure uh, your scattered neutrons. The ESS is a, a next generation neutron source in that it will be incredibly bright. First, a little bit of history uh, or overview. The total construction budget that the member countries have committed to building ESS is 1.843 billion euros. Um, the host countries, of course, are Sweden and Denmark. Uh, the actual accelerator complex where I'm sitting today is being built just outside of Lund, Sweden, next to the Synchrotron Max 4. And our scientific computing and data center actually sits in Copenhagen. So Sweden and both Denmark host uh, the ESS. Then there are a number of additional member countries that all put in money and contributions to, to make it happen. As of about a week ago, the project construction-wise is about 72% complete. So we've made a lot of progress despite the pandemic in 2020. 
Um, in the picture to the left, you see an aerial view of uh, a layout, a diagram of the ESS facility. In red, you can see the actual proton accelerator and to the far right is where this ion source sits, where we will produce the, the initial cloud of protons that will be injected into the red part. These will then be accelerated until it hits what isn't shown in green, which is this tungsten uh, target. And then in yellow, we have a number of experimental holes, are quite large, and they will house uh, the first 15 instruments that today are already under construction. We expect to make the first proton beam to hit the target late 2022, maybe early 23. And sitting over here, I can tell you that date is coming very, very soon. And there's a lot uh, of work that still has to be done. Um, and shortly after that, we will immediately start commissioning our instruments and be ready for first science and users in 2023. Uh, at the moment, we are constructing 15 instruments, but the ultimate goal is to put in 22 and have those completed by 2030. Here is an actual photograph taken with a drone uh, last month to show you how it looks from the sky. Uh, if you can see my cursor, this is the linear accelerator over here and under the P for progress is roughly where the ion source sits. I am sitting in these container box, office boxes over here. And this out here is our campus building where we will move to uh, in February. Over here and here in the long hall, you see the three experimental halls. And this gives you a really good idea of the scale if you look at the construction vehicles down here. These buildings are massive. And back here, you can see Skorna Trafik and the tram depot. So it comes right in front of our facility, but the ESS stop is actually back here. So that's how it looks uh, today. Again, it looks really uh, impressive and a lot of progress. Here is a cartoon version of the experimental halls. And I show you a list of the 15 instruments that are currently under construction. And you can see on the cartoon roughly where they are distributed in the different halls. Um, several of these already have quite some infrastructure installed. Uh, I often go into these uh, e-buildings over here and NMX and Bifrost have already completed or started their cave construction. So these things that look like cartoons are actually now huge blocks of concrete. <laughs> so things are really becoming real and the instruments are, are coming together. Uh, all of these instruments are designed uh, and where they are located to receive a huge range of neutron energies. And each of them really have a specialist neutron science community that they are designed uh, to cater for. The ESS will really support researchers coming from a wide background uh, of disciplines. We have many instruments that support life sciences, soft condensed matter chemistry. There is quite a use of neutrons in battery research uh, that of course has a huge impact in our future. Uh, magnetism, engineering, geosciences, and then of course people like to use neutron imaging to also study archaeologically uh, relevant or important samples. And finally, of course, the particle physics community is very keen uh, to build something out here as well. Due to this extreme high flux that we are building the ESS uh, to deliver, but also all these support labs we are building on site, we are uh, in a good position to enable high impact science. Uh, there are a few reasons for this. Uh, due to the flux, we can really expect to look at much smaller samples than is possible in other facilities. The measurement times will be significantly shorter, um, which will really not only increase the tone turnover, the number of samples we can do, but also allow us to probably take the time to do better measurements. And then all the support labs uh, we are building to help users not only synthesize, but also characterize their samples when they're coming for a, a beam time. So the next few slides, I will tell you about how to access these facilities. Uh, first of all, it is important to know uh, that all operate on a peer review proposal based system. Uh, they all have different access rules and some may have restrictions on the national balance. So that is the nationality of the people applying for beam time, or they may even exclude certain countries based on them not being members or paying for the operations uh, of these uh, facilities. The proposal and nationality of the team requirements then can really vary. So it's really good to check with each facility because the rules can be quite complicated. Usually the facilities issue calls one to, once to twice uh, a year and 
despite or in addition to these calls that are announced and then have a strict deadline and closing date, many also offer rapid access if you can write a proposal and argue why you urgently or rapidly need uh, access to beam time. And this rapid access mode is open all year. Then you're not bound uh, by these deadlines, but you have to have a, a real urgent reason. The next two slides, I'm showing you an example of how it looks if you go hunting for information for users and beam time. The ILL in Grenoble, this is their website and you can always go um, to any of these ISAs, NLZ, so on and find similar types of information specific to that uh, facility. So here you can see if you want to apply for beam time, it gives you all the many different complicated options. And um, like I said, it varies from facility to facility. So it's really good to educate yourself on what each facility offers. Um, there's quite some fine print. Um, so in this case, you can see if you wanna go for the standard beam time that is free to users, you have to subject yourself to external peer review. And here they list the different kinds of um, calls they have, what the deadlines are, and should you be a member from an ILL member country, or what kind of uh, team nationality rules uh, apply. They also give you uh, estimated response time, and you can see that it varies. If it has to go for peer review, uh, it can be four to eight months before you get a, a yes or no. The peer review process is incredibly important. These panels are made up of external scientists, experts in their field, not affiliated uh, at all with the facility and um, they give their expert scientific opinion if the work is important or transformative and does it necessarily earn beam time. Um, there are other options, of course. Not everybody wants to write a peer review proposal and you can think of industry, for example, where they are often quite willing to pay for beam time to not have their proposal peer reviewed or be forced to publish their results if they get anything out of it. So here you can see on the bottom, you actually can bypass peer review if you want proprietary beam time. Um, for urgent experiments, like I said, this rapid access mode, these are often reviewed internally. Again, this varies from facility to facility and these are open all year and you can expect feedback very quickly, but you have to demonstrate uh, the urgency, of course. So if you're interested in this, I invite you to go to ILL or ISIS or MLZ website and, and click around and see how it works for the different facilities. Also at the ILL up here, you can see they have a special tab where you can actually get guidelines for it. And many also give you um, guidelines for how to, how to write a proposal or what this specific uh, facility may want to see. Typically, however, and this is quite a generalization, your proposal is typically limited to two to three pages of content. And this includes figures and references. So it's, it's good to be brief. You should explain the current state of knowledge around the scientific question you're looking to address and also what the expected impact is of neutron measurements or studies of your particular uh, scientific problem. You should also clearly state or motivate why you absolutely must have neutrons and why you can't use other complementary techniques uh, to get at the question. And for example, I'm a protein crystallographer and often in the kinds of proposals we write or review, we would say that we really want to know where hydrogen atoms are in a protein crystal so that we can understand how a drug binds or how the enzyme works. And these are things you cannot do with any other method. So that is usually strongly emphasized uh, in the proposal. And then you should also spend a little bit of space in your proposal to clearly explain what is the measurement you would like to do. So this will of course be aimed at a specific instrument, how you, want to configure the beamline, what kind of sample environment you may need, are you doing ambient measurements, do you need a cryostat, do you need a high pressure device, um, and so on. And then how many hours or days you need and why, and also how many uh, different kinds and types of samples you would like to bring on site. This part is very important, not necessarily for the scientific review of the importance of the proposed work, but for the internal feasibility review that the facilities do, this is a, a crucial bit of information so that we can do some initial assessment of safety and what is involved and if the proposed experiment is even at all possible uh, on the instrumentation uh, the facilities offer. 
So that is a, an important bit of information. And often for the researcher by themselves, this is not easy to figure out. So almost every facility on their website encourage you to talk to the beamline scientist or to the local contacts to reach out to them to discuss your experiment if it's feasible, if it's possible. And it is really important to do that before you sit down to write a proposal so that you know uh, what to put in these important uh, sections. Then you are submitting these proposals on a deadline or not, depending on the mechanism uh, you're applying through. Then there is some time usually while proposals are assessed internally and externally. And then upon review and acceptance of your proposal, of course, you will be notified of your beam time. And I will warn that there are quite some logistics involved uh, from you getting, uh, being told your uh, proposal is accepted to you arriving with a sample. Um, so it's really good to plan in advance and not wait till the last second. The user office and your local contact, could be the instrument scientist, are um, playing a very important supportive role uh, in getting users on site to do sensible experiments. There are many things you have to keep in mind, travel, accommodation, you need lab access, you need to ship your sample. Uh, we may need to prepare special equipment before you arrive and you need to complete safety training and so on. So it's really important to plan in advance and build in enough time in your beam time plans so that you can do everything you would like to do. So now for the, the last half of my talk, I will tell you very specifically about life sciences and biology using neutrons and it is quite focused on my work and journey and how I got to, to use neutrons and actually work for a large scale facility actually for my entire career since I left graduate school. So really the secret why I got interested in neutrons is, lies with the scattering lengths and the isotope sensitivity that the, the probe offers. Shown on the bottom here is my biologist view of the periodic table. You can ignore all the other elements and only focus on these because of course they're what fine <laughs> in proteins and uh, DNA to the most extent. And what you can see here is a comparison of X-ray and neutron scattering lengths with the same um, element types. And it is important to note that in pink or red, uh, with X-rays, you see an increase in the scattering magnitude as you increase the number of electrons. So the amplitude is related to the atomic Z number. Neutrons, however, interact with the atomic nucleus. So this means they can discriminate between different isotopes of the same element. And they are blind to the number of electrons. And if we go to the very left end here of this redu reductionist view of the periodic table, we see hydrogen and its isotope uh, deuterium. And I will remind you that roughly 50% of the atoms by number in biological samples are in fact hydrogen. And you can see with x-rays they are in practice uh, invisible, um, which means we're missing a lot of information. Um, naturally abundant isotope of hydrogen has a negative scattering length, however, this is very hard to see, but there's this little gray dot in the middle of this uh, sphere. But its isotope deuterium, which is chemically extremely similar, has totally opposite uh, scattering. It's actually positive and quite a bit bigger. So it gives a huge advantage if you can uh, replace hydrogen in your sample with deuterium. And this is of course called deuteration or delabeling. And this is really important so that you can maximize the benefit from using neutrons and these unique scattering properties uh, of deuterium. What uh, you would like to see and the technique you want to use really determines then the, the kind of deuterium labeling you should do. Uh, on the right hand side, we show here that um, for small angle neutron scattering and reflectometry, uh, deuteration is really used not so much to see the hydrogens, but really to use the, the labeling as a tool. So we can employ something called contrast variation. And in very simple terms, you can label one component in a complex. So the red green bit on the bottom here is a complex. If we deuterate the red and then put the whole sample in a solvent where we can match the amount of deuterium in the solution, we can actually make that red part completely invisible and only study the green bits. And this strategy is called contrast variation and it is a, a very important and often indispensable part of doing SANS and reflectometry. For crystallography on the left, which is where I live, <laughs> We are actually interested in finding the atomic 3D positions of the actual hydrogen atom. So here we're not deuterating 
as a tool to do contrast variation, here we are actually deuterating to maximize from this positive scattering from the deuterium atoms. And what you can see in the maps here is that it really allows us then to nail down where all the hydrogens are in a protein uh, crystal structure. None of this information you would get normally uh, with x-rays alone, even at extreme uh, or ultra high resolution. So here is a, a very basic summary then or overview of the different types of things you can do. On the left, like I already said, we can do 3D atomic structure determination with crystallography and neutrons. Um, and I will talk more about that when I get to, to my science. And then uh, in the middle and on the right here, we have solution structures and also surfaces. Small angle neutron scattering is really well suited to complexes of things. This could be DNA and protein complexes. It could be lipids and protein complexes. And typically systems like this are quite large and dynamic. So they're not the kinds of things you can pack into a crystal. So you need to study them in solution. And maybe you're interested in the dynamics as well. Then here you would use contrast uh, variation and this selective deuteration to be able to study them together. Um, for surfaces, we can actually do reflectivity measurements where we're looking at surfaces, membranes. These can be monolayers, bilayers, uh, even natural lipids extracted from living things. And here you may want to study a membrane protein embedded in a membrane uh, itself and study the changes and things that happen uh, to the membrane when you introduce external factors. So for structural biology, what I call structural biology, which typically in my very biased view is <laughs> crystallography, uh, neutrons are very useful and complementary to almost every other method the biochemist may, may use. It allows us in the case of crystallography to really visualize directly hydrogen or deuterium atoms. If we can see hydrogen atoms, we can also figure out what they're doing. And many hydrogen atoms are of course involved in hydrogen bonds. It can be within the protein, between water molecules and other waters, uh, it could be between waters and the protein. If we can see or not see a hydrogen, that also tells us something about the protonation state of amino acids in the case of histidine or lysine, where it can be neutral or positively charged. And this gives us then a view of the electrostatics uh, of the active site we may be studying. Uh, furthermore, if we extend from there, we can also study the details of ligand or inhibitor or substrate binding to an enzyme or a protein, because again, we can see the electrostatics and we can also see the hydrogen bonds. And finally, water is an extremely important thing enzymes use as the catalytic agent. And uh, sometimes it is really important to know what kind of water your enzyme may have to understand the mechanism. And here you can really have quite a few waters. You can have uh, H2O, hydronium, hydroxide, and of course, just a proton. And the proton of course has been stripped of all electrons. So it is in practice and in theory, totally invisible with X-ray crystallography. For the other three, um, all three of those would actually just appear as an oxygen in standard X-ray derived electron density maps. But neutrons, because they are super sensitive to these hydrogens will actually reveal and clearly show the difference between a hydroxide and a hydronium, for example. And this has been again and again demonstrated in neutron uh, protein crystallography. And I will say it is exactly all these features that were dangled in front of me as a grad student <laughs> um, that actually got me into to this field. I was studying at the time uh, an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that actually uh, catalyzes the conversion of carbon dioxide to make bicarb and a proton. And at the core of this enzyme catalysis is uh, a nucleophilic attack on carbon dioxide, followed by a series of proton transfer steps through a water network. And my graduate studies were focused on high resolution X-ray studies of this active site to try and figure out is the, the water bound to the zinc, a water or a hydroxide, and what is the charge state of these tyrosine and histidines around the active site? And I was presenting uh, results at a conference. I was midway through graduate school when a beamline scientist came up and chatted about my poster and suggested that I try neutrons to, to get at this problem, that uh, neutrons may be a tool that can actually help give me the information I was desperately looking for during my graduate studies. So, and that's what happened. And 15 years later, I'm still working for a large scale neutron facility. So back to CA. In humans, there are 15 expressed 
uh, isoforms of carbonic anhydrase, and they are involved in many physiological processes. The ions, bicarbonates, and protons, of course, are extremely important uh, to use for pH homeostasis in the body. They're used to um, synthesize cerebrospinal fluid, gluconeogenesis, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But really, one of the most important jobs CA does, it is to make carbon dioxide uh, soluble. So you can transport it where it is produced in your tissues all the way back to the lungs, uh, so you can exhale it. So without CAs, we wouldn't uh, exist. They make respiration and the exhalation of carbon dioxide possible. One of these isoforms, which has been studied to death, you can say is one of the fastest enzymes known, it's carbonic anhydrase 2. And it does this uh, CO2 uh, hydration and proton transfer roughly a million times per second. So it is one of these ultra uber fast uh, enzymes. Uh, and, um, what is also known about CA is that it has been clinical target for many decades. The first CA inhibitors were developed in the 1950s and have been clinically used pretty much since then. CA inhibitors are used as eye drops to treat glaucoma. They can also be taken systemically to be used for hypertension because they're diuretics. And in recent decades, they've also been used to control epilepsy and also to treat acute uh, altitude sickness. And beyond this very traditional hypertension and uh, glaucoma treatment, CA9 in the last 15 years um, has been identified as actually almost exclusively overexpressed in 30 tumor types. It's only in small parts of the digestive system where we see CA9 constantly or constitutively expressed, but in over 30 tumor types to date, it has been found that it is massively overexpressed when the tumors reach a certain size and they become starved for oxygen. They um, start to express a number of uh, metastatic markers, in fact, glucose transporters, angiogenesis, growth factors, and so on. They're basically saying, help, I'm starving, I need sugar and oxygen. <laughs> and part of this cascade uh, is CA9 that starts to be overexpressed when tumors become hypoxic. So the presence of CA is really a very negative clinical indicator. It often indicates that metastasis may already be happening or has happened, and its presence uh, is associated with very low survival rates uh, in patients. When this um, link was found about 10 years ago, CA9 has really emerged now as a very popular cancer target. And uh, there's a lot of efforts globally happening in trying to find compounds that can inhibit CA9. As I told you in the previous slide, CA2 and other CAs are doing a really bunch of really important life-sustaining actions in our bodies. So taking CA inhibitors to knock down CA9 systemically is an extremely bad idea. And of course, to complicate things further, the CA uh, isoforms in the human body are highly conserved. So it is very difficult to design compounds that target one over the other and not just inhibit them all. So there is quite some push to find um, isoform specific inhibitors. And I would argue to do that, we really need to know um, where the, the hydrogen atoms are. So CA has literally was described in 1933 and up to now there's over 15,000 uh, publications uh, in this field and almost a thousand uh, deposited structures. Um, and I will say in the last 10 or more years, when we started to get more neutron data on the active site of this enzyme, we have really been able to start to understand some of the catalytic features in the active site uh, and what they may mean. And now this work has sort of progressed more into looking at CA9 and ligand binding using neutrons so we can discriminate between the different isoforms and see if there's anything we can maximize or profit from to make inhibitors that bind one and not the other. So this is a funny little story on the, on the left is acetazolamide. It's one of these classic uh, glaucoma inhibitors that were developed in the 50s, uh, clearly unsuitable to take uh, systemically. It has a lot of side effects and the amounts you need to reach chemotherapy levels would be extremely deleterious to the patient. So in the literature popped up some decades ago that saccharin was thought to be a, a sort of low level inhibitor of carbonic anhydrase found in our mouths. And it was given as a reason why diet sodas that are saccharin sweetened taste funny to some people. Well, a PhD student in my former lab 
had this idea to go to Starbucks and get a coffee and grab some sweet and low. And he actually went back to the lab, dissolved it and soaked it into crystals uh, of CA9 and observed with x-rays that it bound directly to the active site zinc. This caused a lot of excitement. And they since then collaborated with people looking at cancer cell lines and just dissolving sweet and low. They've since corrected for this and repeated the result with pure uh, saccharin from Sigma. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in this case, they just used sweeten no sweetener and showed a dose, res a dose response curve for cell killing in this breast cancer line. Collaborators of ours in Australia took this idea of using saccharin as a base molecule and synthesized a whole library of inhibitors where they conjugated through a linker different sugars. And one of the best candidates from this screening work was then this SGC, saccharin glucose conjugated molecule, and you can see from the KIs that it has slightly better inhibition profile against CA9, but really it doesn't at all bind to CA2, which is the CA in red blood cells that help us get rid of CO2. So this was a really important discovery and it was also shown to kill cells at a much lower concentration than sweet and low. I think that's mostly because sweet and low is a bunch of filler. The actual amount of saccharin in there is, is quite low. So, um, we set out to use neutrons then to understand what are the differences between how saccharin and this conjugated to glucose saccharin molecule operates. And we collected a number of neutron data sets of the enzyme with nothing bound, of the enzyme with only saccharin, and the enzyme with only this SGC compound. And then we very carefully and specifically compared the different structures to try and understand uh, why one binds better than the other and why CA9 is better inhibited by these, but not at all CA2. So there's a lot of technical crystallography results here and they're really not important for you to understand. We can just look at the pink and blue bits at the bottom and I will just say, if we compare saccharin bound complex to the APO, we see that in blue, the water molecules uh, that overlay with the saccharin molecule are completely displaced. And of course there's an the energetic cost that comes with that, that affects the inhibition constant. And we see in the bottom part here, we see an amino acid side chain and a water molecule that has flipped and rearranged to accommodate or create a slightly bigger pocket uh, for the saccharin to bind. And in fact, this residue that changes is not present in CA2. It is unique to CA9. And we think it is the presence of this specific amino acid at this position that allows this uh, rearrangement to occur, that allows saccharin to bind. Now what happens if we add this massive linker and glucose molecule to this compound is, is quite dramatic. This um, molecule, of course, this view is far more complicated than the saccharin. It's quite a long molecule. And what we observed in the neutron and X-ray crystal structures is that this molecule extends far to another side of the active site and actually interacts again with a set of residues present in CA9 that are completely different in CA2. And in fact, in CA2, where this glucose sits, we see that they are these huge bulky hydrophobic amino acids that are not present in CA9. In other words, the active site, site uh, shape in this area actually allows this glucose to sit or be accommodated in the pocket, giving this far better binding uh, to CA9. In CA2, this uh, part of the molecule have the inhibitor, there is basically no place for it to go. And we think that is why we can't detect any binding at all. And then in addition to this bulky clash, we also see a number of hydrogen bonds uh, broken, rearranged, and water molecules being pushed out of the way. <clears throat> so in summary, then neutron studies here really allowed us to look in atomic detail on the changes in the target protein when the inhibitors go to bind. What I didn't say is we could also see here that both saccharin and this SGC compound bind in the minus one anionic state um, and this is really important for drug design to know the charge of the thing that preferentially binds. We could also then carefully map and inventory the numbers of waters displaced for each compound and the number of hydrogen bonds that were made, broken or remodeled to accommodate the compound. And we were of course uh, able to observe the hydrogen bonds between the ligand and the protein. And all of these together allowed us for the first time to really rationally explain why we observe uh, this preferential binding to CA9 versus CA2 and how that is reflected in the inhibition constants. So all of these details we never could do with only high resolution or even ultra high resolution x-rays. Neutrons really delivered a complementary view uh, to complete 
to complete the, all the levels of information we need to see to do these kinds of studies. And finally, I will just point out with the ESS coming online very soon, uh, we will be able to do all of this on far smaller crystals in a fraction of the time. And it took for the APO, Saccharin and SGC complex, it took roughly two years at different facilities to collect all the data. These would be three days uh, at the ESS, even in the beginning when we're still commissioning. So I very much look forward to that. And I think we can expect uh, big steps forward for drug design and pharmaceutical uh, type research uh, at the ESS in the future. So this is my last slide. I will just, there's so many people involved with these projects over the years. But what I want to point out for, for you guys is really uh, these data were collected at ILL, at the MLZ, at ESRF, and the old and new Max Lab. And without these facilities, we would not have been able to collect the six data sets we needed for that one paper. And the instrument scientists and support staff are really, really excellent uh, during and after the measurements to help us make sense of it all. So with that, I am finished and I'll hand back to Veronica and Anurag. Thank you very much, Zoe. It was so we clapped to this great presentation in the name of all the audience. <laughs> of them, as, I can see, as you can see from the, from the clapping hands, they're clapping <laughs> the presentation. So we kindly ask to the audience uh, if someone would like to address that question to Zoe, because the number of participants uh, is manageable this time, please feel free to write on the chat. You can write on the chat and if you're not, if you're shy, you can also email me yeah. <laughs> if you have any specific questions or want to know more. But I think, I mean, I have like uh, one, it, it, it's, it's a, a question, uh, mm -hmm. but it's also kind of a, yeah, a kind of a suggestion for the audience, because as you shown before, um, in the process of applying for a, for, um, a bean time, uh, mm -hmm. from the ILL webpage, you can see that you can apply also for um, the D-Lab sample preparation. So which means yeah. that you don't have your own facility in your home uh, working place. Uh, ESS will allow users to apply, so to write a proposal for the sample preparation to have them deuterated if you don't have the expertise because they ESS will have the expertise on site, right? Exactly. So, yeah, I should have pointed that out. The, not all these facilities have support labs open, uh, like the D-Lab, the deuteration laboratory at the ILL. And in essence, you would apply for access or support from the lab in the same way you would apply uh, for a beam time. But in that case, you're specifically asking for help to prepare your deuterated sample. The, the D-Lab does this, um, ISIS in the UK do chemical deuteration, so they make small organic molecules synthetically. And us here at ESS, my group, provide both chemical deuteration, biological deuteration, and we also support users for protein crystallization. And we do have one proposal call a year where we ask, uh, we invite users to ask us to make them things. <laughs> and these range from deuterated proteins to uh, small molecule deuterated materials, uh, detergents, lipids, surfactants, and so on. Um, and yeah, it's working and we are going to be a key part of operations here when we also have instruments. Yeah. We have the rather specialized deuteration labs and then we're also building um, sort of more general purpose chemistry labs on site that will be fully accessible to users as well during their beam time or even before if they need to come and prepare something uh, in the labs. And that's a really important aspect, I think. I think neutron facilities operating with no support labs uh, will not be as successful as those that, that really reach out to help the users prepare the proper sample. Precisely, mm -hmm. because users can come from both, so like academia, also private sectors, and might yes. not be that familiar with the process of deuteration no. samples or... So, yeah. Deuteration uh, is complicated. Yeah. It takes long, uh, not always straightforward, and we, many of the facilities, at least in Europe, have these support labs to really take that burden off the user. So they focus on their science and we focus on the sample. <laughs> yeah. Which is really great, the service that ESS will provide to the future users. So, so. yes. I have one other question. This is my background is in photobiochemistry now. And uh, uh, so, what we do is uh, we 
have a solid state electrode and we uh, somehow immobilize the enzymes, the bioenzymes onto those electrodes and try to study these uh, reaction at different time scales. So what is the resolution or uh, is it possible to take these snapshots of this uh, different processes which happens between from picosecond to nanosecond time regime? Absolutely. You would, of course, um, have to choose an instrument that have the right time resolution. It sounds like spectroscopy or some beamline like that may be perfect for those motions and time scales. Uh -huh. okay. Yes, and we're building one of those. So. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> nice. Okay. And for this rapid access that you suggested before, like during the proposal uh, uh, mm -hmm. activities, like, so... Is it more for the private sector? The private sector, we have like uh, a high way to apply for proposal or it will go together with the... Um... Hmm. I don't really, I don't know. We don't have, I have never had industrial users. So I don't know if they use rapid access more, mm -hmm. but I myself have applied for rapid access beam time. And in those cases, it's usually, I unexpectedly got a sample and the sample is uh, unstable. <laughs> and I believe I have a short window of time uh, to take a measurement before the crystal falls apart. So in those cases, we have written that we know these things are not gonna survive until the actual next run cycle. Um, and maybe we don't have the ability to prepare more, then we would beg for rapid access beam time. So in my experience, that's how I would use it. It may also be that there's competition Maybe yeah. if you know a competing group is doing something and you have an edge, maybe you want to ask for rapid access. Yeah, I don't so know if that's considered it's scientifically good. important or not. It may be a consideration. Yeah, yeah. That's so why it's really good to know that actually if you do, if you're studying a very unstable uh, um, yeah, system or material, then it's really good that you can actually use this uh, feature of um, yeah, I, I have certainly done that. And of course, now what we're seeing is almost all these facilities are offering rapid access for any scientific issue question related to SARS coronavirus 2 or COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, so it may also be that facilities choose to do topical or very urgent uh, health topics to society and essentially prioritize uh, to give access very quickly and easily uh, to, to researchers that, that have a need. Yeah, that's a really good. Uh, I have one more curious question. Uh, yes. We, uh, once we put the sample in a neutron beam, uh, the chances of it getting uh, radioactive is, uh, is, is it? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a great question. And it really depends on what uh, the material is composed of. So all the sort of standard atoms that, that I study, protein crystals in other words, uh, they do not activate at all. There's, no. there's no radioactivity at the end of a measurement. However, <laughs> if you're studying biological materials in buffers containing things like sodium, so a PBS buffer or something like that, sodium will actually activate. Not to a high level, it'll cool down after some days or a week, but you can't just walk out uh, with your lab waste at the end. Other materials like uh, I think cobalt, copper, a few of these metals really, really, really activate. So there you can really end up with a problem and your sample may need to be locked away for quite some time uh, to cool down or it may have to be disposed of as radioactive waste. So for the average materials, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, these kinds of things, not a problem. But, but some elements really, really do activate. Yeah, actually we are interested in this transition metal oxides, as you mentioned. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> For yeah. sure, <laughs> those will probably be a problem. Yeah. Um, but they're not a problem. All the facilities are actually designed and equipped to deal with these things. We will have um, shielded cabinets to, to lock activated things up in. We have uh, radiation protection support around the clock uh, to monitor and measure these things and to ensure that we dispose of them properly, of course. Many, for many types of samples, it is sufficient to just wait for some cool down period. Uh, before we can release them. And we survey everything before we release it. So that should be okay. Okay. Perfect. If the audience doesn't have any question, because they are shy probably, or because yeah, they, fine. They, can, they can email if they have something they burning. Mail you, so that's <laughs> yeah, that's no problem. 
And I also know that this video has been recorded, so they... They can go back. They can go back. They were so entertained, they can watch it again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All the information. Um, yes. Yeah. So I would say that it's the time to then thanks uh, Zoe for a great talk and contribution. Oh, thank you, guys.